Well, welcome everyone. This morning we're going to take a look at uh, 1 Peter 3, 13 to 17. So we have a very short passage, and I'm going to actually zero in on one of the verses here. But we, we need the rest to really understand the, the, the context. Um, and, and just as in terms of introduction, we as Christians all have the Great Commission to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all of my commands. And lo, I am with you to the end of the age. So we we all have that commission as disciples. Jesus gathered his disciples to give them that commission. And likewise, we as disciples have that responsibility as well. Now... A while ago, I did a little bit of a, a study on what it really means to, to be a disciple. And the way I look at it, there's, there's really three different legs in this stool. First, we need to study and learn the teachings of Christ you know, that, that has been laid out to us in Scripture. Second, we need to put that into practice. Do what it says, not just read and understand, but, but actually to put that into practice. That, that helps make us disciples. And the third leg is for us to go out and share that and make more disciples. And that's what, what Christ had done in the, in the Great Commission as well, commissioned his disciples to go out and do that. Now, oftentimes when we think about sharing the gospel with others, um, you know, the verse 15 here says to go out and do that with meekness and fear or with gentleness and respect, depending on the, the, uh, the, the, the passage that you look at. And, and oftentimes I get questions from others that how, how can you speak and proclaim the word of God boldly yet with gentleness and respect? And I think this verse and this passage gives us many clues to that. So that's what I'm going to be trying to do today is encourage you in this new year to be disciples and to go out and share and, and make other disciples. Uh, we can all do that in many different contexts, but let's look at what we can learn from Peter here. So Peter, um, the apostle, and oftentimes he's known as the apostle of hope, you know, wrote this letter, and, and that's kind of the, the broader context that, that Peter is writing to, uh, to, to Christians here who are under some persecution. You'll see that as we read the passage, uh, but that's kind of the context here. And it was written probably in the early A.D. 60s. Um, But what I want you to see as we read through this is today, in our culture today, we we see many of the same things. So hopefully we can take that and and, and apply it as well. So let's, let's begin reading 1 Peter 3. 13 to 17. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now, obviously, when, when we look at this passage, you know, we, we see several different things. But, but Peter here is writing. He begins in, the, in verse 13. It says, Who is he who will harm you if you become followers? What is good? So the context, we really need to look back to the previous verse to really understand that, uh, you know, what he means by that particular uh, passage. Um, Verse 12, if you look at that, says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. In other words, God is watching over us. He is listening to his prayers, to our prayers. We are sons and daughters of God, and, and he wants to listen and respond. He always responds and, and watches out for the good of his people. The second half of that verse says, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So again, we, we go into verse 13. It says, who is he will, who will harm you if you become followers of what, are, what is good? Now, some may look at that and say, that's kind of a rhetorical question. So if you're doing good, why would anyone harm you? 
But we, lo- we also look at this and say, in, in the context, when we look at verse 12, this is somewhat of, if God is for you, who can be against you? So in the face of those who seek you harm, in the face of those who are persecuting you, remember that God is watching out over you. So do not fear. But even if you should suffer, verse 14, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. So we see in the context here that those who are reviling these Christians are seeking, they're they're, they're posing threats against them. They're seeking harm. The Christians there feel like they are in danger. Now, I'm going to skip over 15 because we're going to probably spend most of our time on 15 and really unpacking this. And um, probably one of the most extreme situations where I have, and, and, and I will go through and take this very expositorily. So we're going to go in, in verse 15, we're going to look phrase by phrase and, and help understand what that means. But we're, we're to give a defense to everyone who asks a reason for the hope with meekness and fear, having a good conscience. So as we do this, we need to have a good conscience that when they defame, when they defame you as evildoers, and this is one of the things where I think it, it really applies to our situation today, because how many times have we heard in our culture that oh, you Christians are a bunch of haters, right? They're, they're seeking to defame us. Why don't you just let us love who we want to love? Why don't you do this? You know, and, and we could take an example um, of, of defaming, you know, seeking to defame um, us is, um, you know, back in Oregon, maybe a year or two ago, there was a case where a lesbian couple came in and they, they wanted this bakery which happened to be a Christian bakery, to bake them a wedding cake, a lesbian wedding cake. And being Christian owners, they said, no, we can't do that because we cannot condone um, you know, the, the marriage of a lesbian couple. Now, obviously, they were offended. They filed a complaint, and eventually there was a, a lawsuit. And um, unfortunately, they won that lawsuit, but... They'll probably never ever see the money either. But, but you can see the situation today where the unbelievers, those who do not trust, put their trust in Christ, are seeking to defame Christians. And, and, and oftentimes we see as well that they are falsely accusing us. Just as Christ was falsely accused. We, we see this context that, uh, that we have here. And hopefully you're seeing how it, how it relates to today as well. In fact, John 16 says, they will put you out of the synagogue. Yes, a time is coming that whoever kills you will think that they are offering God a service. So, with that context, now let's dig into verse 15, which says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Now, part of this, when we look at this, this is first a contrast between how we should respond. It's in contrast to what the accusers are, are, are coming into and doing. And, and, and that we, first of all, do not need to respond and should not respond in kind. When they seek our harm, when they seek to threaten us, our response should not be to threaten back or to seek their harm or, or to attack back. But instead, we're to set God apart in our hearts. Because we, as Christians, we hold the name of Christ. What we do and how we respond reflects our Redeemer. It reflects who God is. And and, and we need to make sure that we're not responding in kind. Um, I tie this again to verse 16, which says, do this in good conscience. Because oftentimes when we respond in kind, you know, someone attacks us, it's natural uh, oftentimes to, to attack back. Yet when we do that, later on we think and, 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 and we get this sense of guilt. You know, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe I shouldn't have brought that false accusation against that person or, or, or said that. And, and we get this sense of, of guilt. So in good conscience is, is, is really what's, what's important here. Um, and, and, and honoring Christ. But we, we see also the flip side. 
when we respond in the way that, that Peter is talking about, in the way that Christ uh, wants us to, um, to respond, we see that the shame and the guilt goes on them instead. Because why would someone else look, looking on and, and seeing, hey, you know, these people are, are seeking good, but you're attacking them. Why? And, the, and they, they f- feel that sense of shame and guilt. So responding, how we respond is very important uh, here. And it, it, it helps us sanctify God as holy. And it, it, it is Christ that we honor. It is He who lived and was raised and died on the cross to cover our sins. And He was resurrected as well. He is a high priest that can identify with us. He, he went through the same sufferings, the same trials, the, 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 the same situations that we have been through. So likewise, in the context here, in the face of those who seek us harm and, and, and give us threats, we should use the example of Christ and how we respond there as well. We need to be a living example of Christ to those around us. Next we look... And we have the next phrase which says, always be ready. And when, when I look at that, the, the first thing I think of is the example of Philip the Evangelist. How many people know Philip the Evangelist? Okay, there's, you guys know your, your Bible stories and, 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 and so on. Philip the Evangelist, he's called Philip the Evangelist in, in Acts 21. Um, but his, his real story and the example I'm looking at here is, comes from Acts 8. Uh, 26 to, to 40. Now I've got just kind of a summarized, shortened version here to remind everybody. But here, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road that goes to Gaza. So he rose and went. So here we see first the example that God calls us, you know, calls him to always be ready, and he goes. We need, when we are, are called by God to go and do something, we need to go. We need to always be ready to, to do that. Behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, sitting in his chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And he was reading, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before a shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who declared his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Philip ran to him and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And the eunuch answered and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and, beginning at the Scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now, Philip was not necessarily prepared and say, hey, I'm going to go over here and this is what's going to happen and I've I got to get all my sermon notes all ready and, and, and everything else. He just went when God called him. Now, obviously, he was a disciple of Christ, and, and he knew the teachings. But when the opportunity arose, he did not shrink back, but he simply hopped in and started where that eunuch was and explained to him and preached Christ in that situation. So we, likewise, we need to be used and be ready to be used by God and go where we are sent. The next phrase in verse 15 says to be ready, to give a defense. Now, um, you know, this, this is an often quoted verse by um, people engaged in, a, in, in apologetics. And, and, and oftentimes this verse, they'll point out that that Greek word that here is um, translated as defense and in, in many other um, translations is translated as answer um, that this is what we need to do. We need to be ready to give that answer. They, they point out that the Greek word apologia means a legal defense. To, that that we, we take this and, and we reason it out. We, we have a logic. We have a way to present this to others that shows that Christianity and the gospel while it may be a stumbling block, it is, it is a reasonable faith. Now sometimes, and, and this is where we look at it and say, oh, okay, how can we do that and do it with 
meekness and fear or gentleness and respect. Because oftentimes the apologist, when they're focused too much on the reason and logic, they go past this gentleness and respect and become too much focused on the defense and the argumentation. But I'm going to, going to, going to make a little bit of a, a, a distinction here between the apologist, the you know, one who's there to defend the faith, and evangelist who is there to reach the lost and, and, and maker of disciples. Now, I don't want to make too big a deal about this distinction, but um, evangelist is a biblical office. It is, it is a gift. We see that in, in Scripture. Ephesians 4.11 says, you know, Paul is saying, and he gave himself, he, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers. There's many other places where uh, gifts and offices are, are listed throughout the New Testament. Um, and an evangelist is one of those here, but apologist is not. Uh, you know, likewise, Paul wrote to Timothy, his, his protege, in, in 2 Timothy 4. He says, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now, while the word apologist and that office and that gift is not listed in Scripture, it is an important Role or important tool that we have as evangelists, as pastors, as teachers, as parents to engage in apologetics, but to do this for the purpose of making disciples. And, and, and not all are evangelists. You know, and, and you see in the situation with Timothy that you can have multiple gifts. He was, he was a preacher and teacher, but he was also an evangelist. He calls out and says, do the work of an evangelist. And apologetics is part of that, but it's not the, the, the full extent of it. Um, and I think many people are confused by what it means to do the work of an evangelist. Um, I know in our denomination, and I don't know about yours, but oftentimes it, it, it's not really said, but we get the sense that the work of an evangelist is to go out and plant church. And I would say the work of an evangelist is to use the tool of apologetics, but to reach the lost, to bring in and, and make disciples. The result of that work then is church planting. And that might be a different person, different gifts, all those different things. But the work of the evangelist is to reach the lost. Now, I'm going to put another, another important aspect in here because when we look at giving an answer or giving a defense, it's important that we provide a satisfactory answer to someone. In order to do that, we need to understand. So this other aspect here that's not explicit is to listen. And I think this is one of the secrets to proclaiming the gospel boldly, but doing it with, with, with meekness and fear, is, is to listen. Stephen Covey, in his book on the seven habits of highly effective people, says most people listen to respond rather than listen to understand. You know, when you're talking to someone else, you know, and, and, and you're listening to respond, you let them talk a little bit, you, you pick up on one thing, say, hey, i got to respond to that, and maybe you let them finish their sentence or take a breath, and then you hop in and say your thing. As opposed to listening to understand, you're listening to the whole thing. You're seeking to understand. You may ask questions back and forth. You know, listening is important to have that two-way dialogue, that, that asking, answering, listening back and forth throughout this. It's also important as we listen to make eye contact so that we can kind of sense that body language, that, that they get this, they understand this. There's, there's many other different ways we can listen. We can, we can listen to ignore and, okay, they said this and I'm just going to ignore it. That is not a winsome way to listen. Or respond, um, or oftentimes, as the postmodern does, we listen and we just say, "Whatever, it's what you believe, but I believe differently, right?" And uh, but we need to listen in order to understand and to bring the gospel to them. Now, 
I've got one person here in mind uh, that I know that, that does a, a great job of this, um, and that's Corliss Gray. He's not from around here or anything, so no one knows him, but he, he does a great job, and, and he goes out into the park and into different places, and he does interviews with people. Now, he has a list of about 10 different questions that he asks people and, you know, about what they believe and you know, different things, and he'll go through that whole list of, of questions and listen to them but not respond right away. Even though he disagrees with what they say, he may get through the rest of his questions before he comes back and says, ah, well, here's a question. What do you believe about this? Or, or here's what the Bible says. You know, so it, it's important that we have patience as we go through. We don't need to respond right away. We need to, to understand where they're coming from. In, in some of my um, experiences, uh, you know, I, I've gone through... It's not always just listening to the words, because I've I've run into people and I talk to them and and they they they, they get a good understanding that they, they like this and they like that, but maybe they've had a bad experience, maybe they've lost a loved one, maybe they you know there's something else going on in their lives that causes them to reject Christ, to react angrily, to. You know, all these different things. So we need to listen pretty deeply to really, truly understand logically what they're saying, but also emotionally and, 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 and what this means to them. So sharing the gospel with meekness and fear, this listening is a very important aspect. Move on in the verse, and it says, to everyone who asks you. Now, we get that who asks you, and some people may say, oh, well, I'm not going to say anything unless someone asks me. That's, that's not what it means here. Um, you know, when I look at this, I, I, I think it's more of a don't force it on someone, right? Um, you, know, you can still bring it up. You know, bring up the gospel, bring up Christ, who, who is Jesus, what's, you know, what are all these different situations. You, you can bring that up. Uh, but if they get antagonistic and, and don't want to talk, or just say, uh, no, I just don't believe, then you can just leave it alone. You know, we're, we're not here, and we, we don't have the ability to force anyone to believe. That's in God's, God's realm. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Now, the other thing about this is this whole context in, 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 in this verse, and in, in this passage that we're looking at, is, while it may not be incompatible with the idea of friendship evangelism, it really runs very contrary to the basic premise that you should not share the gospel with someone until you've become friends with them. Oftentimes it's used to shut Christians down. You know, if, if, if you've got to spend six months or, or two years making a friend before you can bring up the gospel, it pretty much shuts you down. You, you, you can't do that. Besides, you're building your friendship and your relationship on something that's false. It's not who you are. Who you are, going back to sanctifying Christ, holding him to be holy, who you are as a Christian, your friendships should start with that. Now, Ray Comfort says, I can make a friend in 30 seconds. Now, if you want to keep on going down the path of friendship and evangelism, I can make a friend in 30 seconds and I can bring the gospel to him right there without investing two years in that myself. And it, and, it, and it builds on a false premise that we need to earn that right to speak to others. Now, in this context, remember that Peter is saying there's others who are seeking you harm, there's others who are threatening you, and in this case, give them that answer. Share the gospel with them. And you know, that goes completely contrary to making friends with them. It's, it's your enemies who are coming and attacking you. Share the gospel with them. With everyone. There, there's, there's not... There's not a passage here that says, and to your friends who ask you, it's to everyone. And we go on to the next phrase, or next, really the next word, to give them a reason. And the example I, I, I look at here is the Apostle Paul. He says, and, and, and Paul, over and over, throughout the book of Acts and, and, and everywhere else, he says, Paul was reasoning with them from Scripture. So, reasoning, kind of tying back a little bit to that defense and answer, 
um, is an important aspect. Uh, but the other part here is that we reason from Scripture. If it is not from Scripture, it is merely my opinion versus yours. And they're right to respond, well, that's what you believe. I'll go do what I want, right? Scripture is what gives us the authority. Scripture is what draws people to Christ himself. You know, we could look at Acts 17, you know, when, when Paul's going through Thessalonica and the Bereans and, and, and Athens. Uh, Acts 17, 2 says that Paul, as was his custom, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from Scripture. So that's an important example we see of how we should do this. Because when it's our opinion, we tend to get argumentative. We need to defend our opinion. But when it's God's word, it has authority. It has authority that we do not even recognize at times. Because God's word is living and active. It is, it is effective. It does not go out void. And we forget sometimes. We think the word of God is simply words. But there is, there is power behind that as well. Uh, Acts 17, 17, you now here in Athens, as he, as he entered Athens, it says, Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. So let me point out that, you know, here it's in the marketplace daily. It's, it, it's not something where we just wait for people to come into us and then we'll tell them. But Paul, in his example, he's going out into the marketplace and not, not necessarily doing a marketing plan and saying, hey, here's the people I want to reach. It says, with those who happen to be there, God will bring people into your life, into your path, and, and give you the situations where you can bring the gospel to them. But the first part of this verse is important too. The first part of the voice, he says, he went to the synagogue of the Jews and the Gentile worshipers. Each and every one of us, just because you're sitting in this church, listening, and a member, and, 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 and all these things, we still need to hear the gospel. You know, there, there's all sorts of situations you know, where we can't just assume, and, and we, we need to get the gospel to each and every person. You know, it, it may be that you're coming here just because it's always been a family tradition. I'm, I'm, I'm part of this, and... and and I'm just here, but we need to hear the gospel and share the gospel here in church as well. Or maybe we all go through ups and downs in our, in our faith, and maybe we need to hear that and remind us of what Christ has done for us as well. So it's important that we don't wait for people to come in, but we go out, but we also preach and share the gospel here in the context of the church. Now, verse 5 in this chapter as well says, But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, and it goes on and says, basically, they started a riot and, and ran Paul out of town. So the important thing here is that despite your logic, despite your reasoning, despite all of these things, there's still going to be people who are not persuaded. And it's not our job as men to persuade others. You know, um, but it is God's responsibility. It's, it's Him through the working of His Holy Spirit and, and, and regeneration to draw them to Him. And we've got a few verses here to look at. You know, John 6, when Jesus was speaking, He says, No one can come to Me unless the Father who sent Me draws him. So it is God who is drawing him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Or John 12, after Jesus comes in and the triumphal and, and, um, entry into Jerusalem right before his crucifi crucifixion. He says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, indicating his crucifixion, will draw all people to myself. So we understand, even though we may not do everything per per perfectly, you know, it, it's not, you know, we are sinners, we are fallible, we use fallible logic, we use fallible reasoning, fallible um, all sorts of different things, but it's not up to us. So, so don't feel like, hey, I can't do this quite right, so I'm not going to do it, because God uses fallible people or fallible situations to draw people to him. It is he that does the work 
again, to, to reinforce that. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 to 8. Um, as Paul is speaking to the Corinthians then, and, and, and some are saying, hey, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos. And Paul says, who is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers through whom you believe as the Lord gave to each one? In other words, God uses his people to bring others. They're the ministers through whom they believed. He goes on, verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. It is the work of God to bring someone in. So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. He closes out with with some encouragement. And while he says, now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So he's encouraging us while, while God is the one drawing people to him. We have a responsibility to go out to plant, to water, to, you know, to, to make disciples in whatever way is fitting and, and that, that you are gifted in. And, and he will give us a reward for the work and the responsibility that we have taken there. And, and, and the final phrase that we're going to look at today here is, for the hope that is in you. All of this is, is kind of context to bring the key focus... And that is the hope that is in us. And that hope is Christ. That hope is the gospel, the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. It is this that we are to get to. This, that our, our purpose is to share the gospel. Those people may or may not respond to the gospel, but this is what will draw them, if nothing else. This is our purpose in responding to the people who seek to harm us, to to threaten us, to defame us, all these things, is to point them to the gospel. For that is to be, you know, that is the hope, our, our hope of eternal life. Now, the atheist, the humanist, and, and, and many people believe what they say. You know, the atheist will say, hope, you know, why do you Christians do that? You know, why, why do you just hang everything on this wishful thinking? But that's not how the Bible defines the word hope. Hope is not wishful thinking, but is a deep-rooted assurance of a yet-to-be-fulfilled promise. We have the promise of, of God that he sent his son to redeem us and that he will return again. And because of what he has done, we will have eternal life. That is, a, that is the hope that we have. That is the promise that is not yet fulfilled um, that we have that deep assurance in. Now, we have that deep assurance for a number of reasons, but this is why it's important as we speak with others, to tell of the wondrous works that God has done. Because we can point to Christ's life, death, and resurrection, and that there were over 600 prophecies pointing towards towards that. And they are all fulfilled. God is faithful. God is trustworthy. God does wondrous things. How can he... Go back to Philip the Evangelist when the, the, the eunuch was reading from Isaiah hundreds of years before Christ. And he says, this is pointing towards Christ. And he preached Christ. It builds in us that assurance that we can put our trust in God and who he is and all of his promises. We need to live in that way. That we have that hope that deep-rooted assurance in who God is. And even in the face of suffering, we have the foresight, the, the, the mindset that these people need to hear the gospel. And we, we do it not by following their example, but by following Christ's example. We need to provide answers for them and, and, and give reasons and, and listen. But really, most importantly, it's not about my story. It's not about anything else, but it's about that hope that we have in Christ.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.